Everybody, we're back for the second lecture. It's going to be entitled, uh, the last one was wonderful, it was on fire, man. I loved it. Yes. This one is going to be called An Overview of the Historical Origins of Christianity. And with that, I give you back Dr. Walter Williams. Okay, thank you so much. I'm back now. And uh, we had a little break, and I hope everybody got refreshed. and. Uh, and now we're going to settle in on our second lecture. Uh, I want to give some thanks to people like Brother Shabazz and, and, and his wife, Jamila, uh, again for bringing me to New York. And I also want to uh, give thanks to my wife, Arnetta, for preparing me to come here and be my companion while I'm here. That's right. but one of the main things is that uh, I can't stay. No, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you very much, but but while here in New York, I can't stay. My wife and I, we can't stay in the streets, right? That's right. So, so therefore, we have uh, uh, two gracious hosts and hostesses mm -hmm. in uh, the name of uh, Lady Brown and. Right, right. Okay. So, we have to uh, point out uh, the kindness of the Browns for having us as guests in their home. Okay, so I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. I want to uh, give a uh, short overview. I didn't intend to talk as long as I did on the first lecture, but you know how you get carried away. Mm -hmm. And you get caught up and uh, you just continue, you know, and then I'm long winded anyway. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I'm going to give you a short overview on Christianity. Um, the next time that I'm invited mm -hmm. back to New York by right. Brother Shabbat That's right. and, um, and his wife, uh, Jamila, I'm going to uh, be prepared to give a lecture. Uh, a full lecture on the historical origin of, of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. All right. Okay, but I'm going to start off doing that. <laughs> I'm not going to put that last. Then <laughs> start a lecture and then be tired. <laughs> you know. So anyway, uh, I want to you know give you an uh, overview on Christianity because uh, our people, our African people. Uh, hung up and caught up in these various religions, as we mentioned before uh, in the first lecture. So I want to bring out some historical facts about these various religions. And the very first religion is Christianity. Okay? That's our very first religion that was created by man. And the people who created the religion called Christianity, and the people who created this image, this is a created creature, never existed. Okay? But this is a created creature called Jesus the Christ, created in Egypt, in Africa, by our uh, Melkite Coptic Egyptians. Those were the Uncle Toms of antiquity. <laughs> okay? They were the Colin Powell. <laughs> <laughs> they were the kind of Schleser Reich. <laughs> they were the uh, Clarence Uncle Tom ass. <laughs> okay? So they, they, they're the ones that created this image. But this image in Christianity was created for the Europeans. It wasn't created for us. So it's very important to know that. 
Another thing I want to bring out, the importance of uh, the polemic. The word polemic means argument. This argument over the human nature of this created creature known to us today as Jesus the Christ. This argument went on for 921 years whether this thing here that we call Jesus the Christ had a human nature or not. 921 years. But see, no one is telling you that. But I wrote this book for one race of people, African people, living in America and throughout the world. This is a message in here for you. Okay? And I wrote it not to sell to the world. I wrote this book for you, information for our African community. Okay? And I don't make a living selling books. I don't make a living writing books. That's not how I make my living. Okay? I don't make a living giving lectures. I, don't, I used to have an ancient Egyptian museum for 11 years in, in Chicago. I sold the building and put the artifacts into storage in the year 201. Okay? So we're going to do something else with the ancient Egyptian uh, uh, artifacts that I have. It's going into another museum to resurrect the ancient <coughs> Egyptians. Okay? So I'm, I'm serious and sincere. Okay? I will tell you the truth and bring the facts with the truth. People ask me, saying, what is the truth? Truth is, is, is very wide. I mean, it's, it can be interpreted by people in general. But in the first lecture, I gave you the, 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 the truth. You know what the truth is? You are the truth. Every human being on earth is the truth. You walk around with the truth inside of you. That's your spirituality. So therefore, you can't deny that. There's no argument over that. So in my writings and research, I try to look for the truth. I always go and look for the origin of a subject. Like I told one young man this evening, go and find the origin of that subject. And when you do that, you will, you will be laying a foundation of understanding about that subject, what you're talking about, whatever the subject may be. If you don't know the origin of it, then you don't know the subject. And you have to know dates. Dates are very important, like I teach my uh, students. If you want to be a scholar, a historian, you have to know dates. Very simple. If you don't know dates, you know historian. You, then you're just talking barbershop talk, <laughs> pool room talk. I ain't talking outside of your neck. Mm. See? Because if I, you tell me so, so and so, so and so, I say, okay, what day was that? You say, well, I don't know. Then you don't know the subject. <laughs> okay? Come and tell me, well, the documents, they found documents that say so and so, okay, what alphabet was the document written in? I don't know. Then, you, <laughs> then how can you bring this to me? No something. So in this book, in each book, I put, as I end uh, my writings, I always bring you facts which are stronger than argument. This is what was told to me many years ago about facts. I was told that facts is stronger than argument, more dependable than opinions, mm -hmm. uh, more profound than reasoning, silences dispute, supersedes predictions and facts, always in the argument. When you bring facts, that's it, it's over. See, there's no more arguing over the facts. See, then you don't understand the facts. See, so today, this evening, I'm gonna bring you some facts concerning Christianity and this image that we know today as Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I began, I've been studying for over 30 years now. And uh, when I first began to study, uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit. See, I used to be a professional jazz musician. I used to play the saxophone. You know, Charlie Parker and Sonny Stitt, those are my guys. You know, I used to play bebop. You know, one of the bebop, I had my little tam on, you know. <laughs> had my axe, you know, going to the gig, you know. <laughs> hey, that was the time. But anyway, I met a musician 
which was old enough to be my father at the time, right out of high school by the name of Sun Ra. Mm -hmm. Sun Ra used to live in New York. Mm -hmm. But I didn't play that out of space music. We played contemporary jazz, all the things you are, what is this thing called uh, Stardust, Embraceable Youth, songs like that. So we used to go up on the fourth floor. He had a, an apartment up there on the fourth floor in the building in Chicago. So all the young cats, I was right out of high school, all the young cats used to go up there and listen to some uh, philosopher, philosophy for, from, from early, I mean, in the evening to early in the morning. You know, I was, I was in trouble many, many mornings coming home to my mother. <laughs> Boy, where you been? I've been worried about you. Bam! You know. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> anyway, I, what he told us, some of us said, that we were descendants of the greatest people that has ever lived on planet Earth, known to us today in the history of ancient Egyptians. Now, out of high school, you know, the school system don't teach us that. They teach us away from uh, ancient Egypt. They teach you, when I went to school, they gave me a book called Little Black Sambo. Mm. <laughs> you know about that too, don't you? Okay. Now, this is what I was supposed to be, Little Black Sambo. Therefore, all you young people who don't know anything about Black Sambo, such as Jamila. <laughs> 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 and a few others in here. But anyway, uh, Little Black Sambo was a little African boy who took the tiger by the tail and went around a tree, round and around and around, until both turned to butter. But they gave Little Black Sambo to the white children too, the white kids. That was to make them feel superior over us. And Little Black Sambo was supposed to make us inferior. But see, Little Black Sambo has fooled them. Little Black Sambo found out that I was a descendant of the greatest people that has ever walked this earth, known to us today in history as the ancient Egyptian. Isn't that something? I found that out through Sun Ra. You see? So, long story short, I get married. Uh, my wife and I took a trip to Italy. And they were showing us through Italy uh, some of their uh, ruins and the supposed history and so forth and so on. And I was feeling very bad because uh, I didn't have anything to show the world as a Negro. Okay? Until the, the tour guide said on the wrong bus, said, and when uh, the Romans went to Egypt to receive their civilization, I said, oh, oh, big light bulb illuminated inside of me. I said, my goodness. If these Europeans went to Egypt to receive their civilization, and I was told that I was descended of the ancient Egyptians, then I should know something about it. Huh? So what I did, I went to, when I got back to America, I went and got me a uh, magnifying glass. And every pictorial book on ancient Egypt that I could find. And what I was looking for, through my magnifying glass, was to look at all of those depictions that saying that mm. these are ancient Egyptians. And I wanted to find out whether these depictions look like me and look like you. Mm. And once I was convinced of that, that's where I started my studies. Now, let's move on, okay? If you want to clap, it's okay. <laughs> So then I began to look for any book or books that, that had history attached to it. Any book. You know, I was just like a fiend. And, and, and books was coming everywhere. Because, you see, your mind is very, very powerful. Okay? Whatever you put up here that you want to attract in your life, it'll come. Because light attracts light. You see? You know, one time, I, see, I, I, uh, my wife and I, we collect antiques, okay? And uh, I was, uh, at, at one time, I, you know, uh, just say, say, for instance, antique rugs. Mm -hmm. Rugs was coming out of everywhere. Because <laughs> I had put it in my mind. I ended up with about 22 Oriental, uh, uh, not Oriental, but uh, 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 rugs. 
you know, uh, old antique rugs and things, good condition and so forth and so on. So I'm just showing you how, how your mind can attract whatever you put in it, you know. So uh, these history books are just, just coming into my life and I'm studying, you know. And you have to study the subject until you get a foundation and a concept, see. Like uh, other young musicians just come to me and say, hey man, I want to play jazz. I say, okay, what instrument you play? Well, I play the trumpet. I say, who? He say, who you want to play like? I want to play like Dizzy Gillespie. Well, then you get every Dizzy Gillespie record that you can find, mm -hmm. and listen to nobody but Dizzy Gillespie, until you get a concept of what he's doing. And then after you get that concept and get you a foundation inside of you, then you can listen to any type type of music, because you know what they're doing, because you have a foundation. So I had to do the same thing in studying uh, history, you know. And a young man came to my museum and I was uh, telling him about some things that he was bringing to me. I said, well, historically that's not correct. So he was frustrated, so he ran home and got a great big old box of books. And he came in and dropped them at my feet. He said, now which one of these books <laughs> should I read? I said, you take all these books and throw them out. I said, and I told him what to do to begin his studies. I said, then, I said, then you can go back, once you get your concept, and your foundation in you, uh, understanding what you uh, are trying to achieve, then you can go back and read those books and you know exactly what, what's in them. See, I can pick up a book and look at the uh, table of contents. I can tell you whether the book has any value or whether I'm wasting my time. So anyway, uh, I was down one day in the studio of, of one of my uh, high school uh, musician friends. We all came out of DuSable High School. Uh, and uh, uh, he was teaching a saxophone lesson. He was, he's a saxophone player, he's still playing music. And he had a, a, a shelf full of books. So while waiting for him to, to, to teach his student and finish up with the, his student, I went over to his books, uh, bookshelf and, 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 and I picked up a book called The Outline of History. And when I picked that book up, see this is all pertaining to how I got to discover. See, I didn't set out to discover and prove that there was no Jesus Christ. That's not my intent. That was, wasn't my intent. I had no idea that there was no Jesus Christ. <laughs> I had no idea was that. Okay? Because I had believed that there was a Jesus Christ, but even though my family were not uh, staunch Christians. Mm -hmm. I never went to, I went to church one time that I can remember as a boy. And my mother and I went to the church and that minister, old, old, old Reverend Chicken Wing, he said, and God wants you! And I, oh, I jumped up and ran out of the church. And my mother ran out and my heart is beating and I'm sweating and can't on she, you know, never went back since. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> it frightened me. And I want God to want me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> May kill me, who knows? <laughs> God may, may do like, like he did those, uh, those tsunami victims. Huh? He killed all two, over 250,000 people. Huh? I asked the, I asked the religious people, said, where, where was God? All those people prayed to God, didn't they? But they died? Huh? Where was God? Huh? You see that? Martin Luther, Martin Luther King's uh, mother and father was in the church. They were good Christians. They prayed all the time. They got, they got assassinated in there. Where was God? Mm. Where was God? When the Europeans came into Africa and took our ancestors out and made slaves out of them, terrorized them in this country to make slaves, where was God? You see? So that God is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Okay? But getting back, to, 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 to how I came about the understanding of learning what the history of Christianity was about. So I picked this book up called The Outline of History by H.G. Wells. Mm -hmm. And next time I come, I'll bring that book. Yes. And I opened up the page to that book. And I saw an image in that book just like this. 
It said, under the caption of this picture, I said, that's Jesus Christ. But it says, Serapis. I said, uh, oh, Serapis? I said, this is Jesus the Christ. Looks exactly like Jesus Christ. Then I began to read. Now listen to this. I began to read on the pages that's, uh, uh, that was on, uh, was attached to this uh, Serapis image that we know today as Jesus Christ. I began to read that in the cult of Serapis, he is spoken of as the Savior. I said, what? I said, this is the same attributes that they give to this Jesus the Christ. Then it went on to say that he raises the dead. I said, what? Raises the dead? I said, this is the same attributes that they give to this Jesus the Christ. Then it says that even after death, you will always be in his presence. Don't Reverend Chicken Wing tell you all that at these funerals? Huh? Say, old oh, Moses, gone on to be with the Lord. Huh? You see? So I said, these are the same attributes that they're given to this Jesus the Christ. I said, wow. I said, what's going on here? So it says, Serapis. And I put a tracer. I was focusing in on Serapis only. Through study. And I began to... Uh, Research Serapis. And I found out that uh, this Serapis was given to the successor of Alexander the Greek. I don't use the great because I'm not going to call no European great that tried to destroy my ancestors. I'm not going to do that. I can give you the Greek, that's the best I can do for him. Okay? Not the great. And when Alexander came into Egypt, I'm going to tell you how it started. He is the first known European to come into, into the continent of Africa in Egypt. Historically known. Okay? He came in in 332 BCE. Didn't have to have an army to invade. You know why? Because the ancient Egyptians never had an army. Nor did they have jails. They didn't have no jails. Civilized people don't have armies and jails. Okay? You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Only corrupt people have jails. If you have a corrupt government, quite naturally the people living in the secular community are going to be corrupt. So when they get out of line, you put them in jail. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you have an army. What is your army for? To go around and terrorize other people around the world. Rape their women. Take their land. Steal from them. Kill them. Take their resources. Everything. That's what you need an army for. Okay? Now, anybody seen the picture uh, the movie called Alexander. If you go to see Alexander, my wife and I, we went to see Alexander. It's a funny thing when they, about Alexander, that movie. They showed Alexander killing, robbing, stealing all throughout the movie. And he, they only talk about Alexander going into Egypt. They never showed Alexander coming into Egypt. You know why? First, if they had, if, if showed Alexander coming into Egypt, they would have had to show Africans in Egypt. They didn't want to do that. Secondly, they would have showed that the ancient Egyptians had no army. You see? A civilized people, the ancient Egyptian, civilized this whole entire world of all races. Crease and color are using the, the civilization and the culture of the ancient Egyptian, right? At this very moment that I'm talking to you. You cannot go around to civilize other people throughout the world and then bust them upside their head at the same time and rape their women at the same time and plunder their land and steal from them and lie and cheat. You can't do that. 
You're out of cosmic order. Okay? You're out of cosmic order. You're out of cosmic order when you embrace a religion. You're out of tune with cosmic order. You see that? We have to bring balance back to this world. And we're the only people on earth that can do that. Bring balance. No other race of people can do that because we are the Pied Pipers of the world. Mm. The world is following this American, African, Negro <laughs> who's been trained to call himself a Negro, Black, and African American. The world is following us. If we turn our caps backwards, they do it too. They don't know why they're doing it. They're following us. Okay? When we, when we do the lecture slide, they are there doing the lecture slide too. <laughs> You see? So, when we do, <laughs> when we rap, they out there trying to rap too. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. Huh? When we hip hop, they wearing them old baggy bitches and showing the crack of they uh, behind. They don't know what they're doing. They following the, the snake rope. See, we're the Pied Piper. See? And then they have a, 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 a television program that comes on every Saturday. Okay, and, 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 and what's the name of it now? Soul Train. Soul Train. <laughs> they have Soul Train to teach white people and the other races of people how to dance. <laughs> how, why, you think that, why you think it's been on so long? <laughs> uh, look, Don Cornelius got so old his face dropped. <laughs> okay. And they're going to retirement. Soul train is still on. White folks, uh, uh, they out there every weekend trying to learn the latest dance because we change dances on them every week. <laughs> One week we're killing roaches. <laughs> Kill that roach, squish, squash, you know. <laughs> next, next week we're doing the boogaloo, you know. <laughs> so they can't keep up with us. Uh -oh. So they do that by way of soul train. See? So when you embrace a religion, I have to interject all this stuff. It's all basically right. the right. same thing. When you embrace a religion, you're out of tune with cosmic world order. We're the only people that can bring balance back to the world. Okay? Only people. Okay? So I'm talking about the American African. The American African. You see that? We're the only one, because the other Africans out there, oh, miss, they are, oh, they out of it. Uh, Brother Clemson went to Ghana, and he told me that... Nigeria. Nigeria, and, uh, yeah. And Ghana, too. And Ghana, too. I've said Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> he went to Ghana, and Nigeria, they had, to, they had some of the biggest posters of this Jesus the Christ, this white Jesus. Yeah, I know about it. Uh, you know about it? Yeah. You know, they'd be uh, all on the bus. Praying and singing to Jesus. You know, so, uh, hey, I don't, hey, we have to mark them all. We have to start here in America. Okay? Where the leading Africans live. Okay? So now, uh, here you have, uh, going back to the historical origin of Christianity, I found out that when Alexander came into Egypt, didn't have to bring an army, like I mentioned, but he was in awe of what he saw. He said, wow, look at these people here. Look at this civilization. They didn't have to, they're doing this peacefully. They didn't have, no armies, and they're not fighting and killing each other. See? Because every white man, and every white woman, and every white child you see walking on earth today, are descendants of savages. Mm -hmm. I'm not making fun of them. This is their record. I didn't make their record. Mm -hmm. Huh? Did I make their record? No. Okay. When you when a criminal go before the judge, and the judge has his record before him, he say, Oh, I see you have stole cars, you have broken into homes, you have raped women, you know, and so forth. Who made that record? The thief. 
or the person before the judge. So when I make that statement, I'm not criticizing them. I'm bringing facts. Stronger than argument. More profound than reasoning. More dependable than opinion. Mm. Silences dispute. Supersedes predictions and facts always ends the argument. Mm. You see? So now, Alexander comes into Egypt in 332 BCE. He lived for nine years and he died. His army general, Ptolemy I Lagi, took over Egypt. And the Greeks and the Romans knew that in order to rule Egypt, they had to be accepted by the ancient Egyptian sacred society. They had to be accepted by them. But our ancestors did not take foreigners into their sacred society. They handpicked their own African kind to come in. Okay? So when they tried to get in, they was turned down, said, No, we don't we don't do that. We don't and then our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, did not race mix. They didn't mixed with no race, other races, foreign races, even though they went around the world civilizing other races, but they never mixed with them. Okay? So, this Ptolemy thought up a, a, a great idea. He, he went and found him a temple in Memphis, Egypt, to make his image into a god. And what this, these group of male kite Coptic Egyptians did. They took two of our deities, uh, Osiris and Apus, and came out with the name Serapus. And they gave it to this image that you now see as Jesus the Christ. Gave it to Ptolemy one Lagi called Sota. The word S-O-T-E-R means Savior. Okay? This is the image that you're worshiping today as Jesus the Christ, the Savior. This is the image of Ptolemy I Lagi, the successor of Alexander the Greek, after Alexander and the Greeks came into Egypt. You see that? This is the image. So he went to the temples and said, okay, now that I am made into a god, accept me. They said, no, we're not going to do that, man. We still want to accept you. So he closed down all of the temples throughout Egypt and except for the temple in Memphis, Egypt that made his image into a god. And he confiscated all of their divine scroll manuscripts from those other temples and housed it into the temple in Memphis, Egypt where they had made his image into a, a, a god. But that image was named Serapus. It's in this book, Serapus. Okay? And then he began to try to get the grassroots Coptic Egyptians to accept this image like they accepted their deity, Osiris. Hmm. Now you look at this deity of Osiris, that's one of our ancestors. Now, who does this Osiris image look like? It looks like us, don't it? Huh? Yeah. Looks like us. <clears throat> don't, don't, uh, we don't look like this. <laughs> you see that? It's a difference. See? So now, since we didn't do that, he closed down all the temples throughout Egypt, confiscated all of our uh, sacred writings from our ancestors' uh, uh, temples throughout Egypt. Housed it into the temple in Memphis, Egypt that made his image into a deity, supposed deity, known as the Rapus. They gave, they took two of our deities, Osiris and Apus, and put it together and made a composite of the two names of Osiris. Gave him the name of Osiris, Osiris. Okay? So every, every uh, Ptolemy that ruled Egypt thereafter became the vicar of Serapis, who sat on that throne. Just like the Pope over in Rome today. He is the vicar of Christ. That means the same as. The vicar means the same as Christ. You see? So these Ptolemy and Roman rules became the same as Serapis. 
the same as this image. You see that? But in the meantime, um, his grandson told me three, you get his one. The grandson of Ptolemy, one laggy called Sota, who this image of Serapis was, 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 was made into a god, now known today as Jesus Christ. He built a temple and a, a library that's a, that was adjacent to that building, a temple called the Serapium Temple. And the library that he built, the Jason building is called, today, is called the Great Library of Egypt. Okay? And he built other temples uh, throughout Egypt. Okay? He built the Mithraeum in Syria. That's all part of, like I told you, that area over there in Syria is part of the African continent. See? But those Greeks was ruling all that area over there. See? So, um, he built another temple to his grandfather in Canopolis, Egypt. Okay? But we're going to concentrate on the one, the Serapium Temple in Alexandria, Egypt, where this supposed great library was, was, was made. Because there's a lot of uh, misinformation floating around about the great library of Egypt. They said, uh, tradition is saying that the teacher of Alexander the Greek was one Aristotle. And that Aristotle wrote hundreds of books. And Alexander the Greek built the Serapium Temple and this great library adjacent building next to the Serapium Temple. Besides, story go to house Aristotle's book. But when you first when you search a little further, you'll find out there was uh, Ptolemy III, you get his one who built the great library and, 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 and this uh, Serapium temple in Alexandria, Egypt, okay? So now, uh, I come along and say that's, uh, it's never been an Aristotle, like I told you before. A Socrates never happened, never been in human form, or Plato. Why? Herodotus never been human. The Greeks had no alphabet. So how can Aristotle write all these books? Okay? And I told you that when Alexander the Greek came into Egypt and forced the Greek language on our ancestors, and our ancestors were the only literate people on earth with three forms of writing, they applied an alphabet after learning the Greek language to the Greek language. <coughs> Today they say that this is the Greek alphabet. That's a misnomer. It's all in my book. So. Here you have uh, this library, but what Ptolemy III, you get his one did, he went into Memphis, Egypt, because his grandfather had closed down all of those temples throughout Egypt, because they wouldn't worship him. He went into uh, Alexandria, Egypt, I'm sorry, went into Memphis, Egypt, and got all those scrolls out of there and housed them into this uh, Serapium temple, the annex building. That's the reason why today it is, it, it is called the Great Library of Egypt. Because you have, in order to have a library, you have to have literature. In order to have literature, you have to have an alphabet. Okay? And a form of writing. So the, let that be known. So, you know, don't get hung up in that, but it's in my book. Now, <clears throat> in the meantime, all these Ptolemy rulers, after Ptolemy, uh, one laggy. Now this happened, this image of, 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 of Serapis, using the image of Ptolemy one laggy happened in 320 B.C. 320 B.C. Okay, it's in the book. 320 B.C. And because he took power in 323 after the death of Alexander. So in 320 he did all this uh, going around to the temples and asking them to make uh, his image into a god was refused and he closed them all down until he found his temples in, temple in Memphis, Egypt to make his image into a god. Now we are going to <coughs> fast forward a little bit. I hope you're getting the picture of how this Christianity started out.
and how this image was created. We're going to fast forward into the time of Arius. Okay, we're talking about uh, 600 years later. This image was made in 320 BC. BC times you count down. That's how you count BC times down. Now we're going into around uh, 313 and 319. Uh, a, B, C, E. I, don't, I can't use A, D. If I use A, D, then I would be trapped because A, D means uh, a nano, a nano, a nano, di, uh, a nano, a nano, Okay? That means in the time of our Lord. See, so that was no, in the time of our Lord, there's no Jesus Christ. So I can't use anno denomine. Okay? I have to use A, B, C, E. That's my own term. After B, C, E ran out. <laughs> See? So you're not going to get me hung up in that. See? So, <laughs> smart, right? Okay. <laughs> anno domini. That's what it is. Anno, an, an, anno dom, dom, domini. But anyway, in the time of our Lord, um, we're going to come up to the time of the Nicene Council, the first Nicene Council, 325 uh, ABCE. Okay? All right? We're going to come up to that. Now, there are three things that brought about the Council of Nicaea I, 325. And I think that I'm the only scholar that's bringing this out in this book of any race, creed, or color. I'm saying that the three things was the Donatist schismatic controversy, the donation of Constantine, and the strong statement by Arius. And I break all that down in my book. The Donatist schismatic controversy was a North African schism among the Africans themselves. Because uh, they had a separate community because when Ptolemy I Lagi was refused entrance into the temples in Egypt, they refused him because they didn't accept foreigners and they didn't uh, look upon him as a god. So he closed them down. But they were forbidden to create any other temples for religious fellowship, so they used their home and the cemetery to do that, okay? The cemetery was used to honor their martyr dead, like we uh, uh, honor Martin Luther King, it's done at a cemetery around his grave and so forth and so on. We used our homes to, to, to fellowship because we were forbidden to build any other buildings for that purpose, okay? This is, a, this is what the, uh, the, the Greeks forbidden us to do our ancestors to do, okay? So, here you have uh, the Donatist schismatic controversy, which is a North African schism. It's all in the encyclopedia. You look up any encyclopedia, look up the Donatist schismatic controversy. It's there. And this is a North African schism. It happened like this. Um, Diocletian, who was uh, the Byzantine ruler at the time wanted members of our exterior Coptic community to, to turn over their sacred writings to him. And uh, uh, Mensurius, uh, who was a member of the Coptic Egyptian community, turned those writings over. Donatus, Bishop Donatus said he shouldn't have done it. Have, have, shouldn't have done it. Okay? And uh, this caused a schism. Then here come Bishop Secundus, the Metropolitan uh, Bishop. He comes in and joins Donatus. Say you shouldn't have done it, you should have martyred yourself. Just like your predecessors before you did. And that's, that, that is known in history as the Donatus schismatic controversy that split our African unity in the grassroots community. Just like in, in uh, Chicago, that was Harold Washington running for mayor 
You remember that? Yes. We in Chicago, the African community was unified behind him and we voted and put him on the fifth floor of City Hall. When he died in 1987, there was a split in our African community in Chicago between Eugene Sawyer and Tim Evans, running for two African brothers running for, for a mayor of Chicago. And that caused a split in our community, a weakness, and, and a white man came up in between that split, Mayor Richard Daly, that you have today. Okay? So the same thing in the Don Sisky Somatic controversy. That controversy and that split in the, in the African community gave Constantine the bright idea. He said, now we can, uh, I can uh, get this community, since it's split, to accept Serapis. See? See, they needed our African spirituality to spiritualize this. You see? Mm -hmm. See, so when you hoop and holler in church, oh, I love Jesus, and room at the cross, and all that kind of stuff, you're spiritualizing this thing. See? So, so, uh, this is what happened. So, what he did, Constantine did, he found a member in our African community by the name of Sylvester Wan. And he gave, he took, went up to Sylvester and said, Sylvester, I will give you my imperial emblem on a temporal basis if you will accept this offer. And it's known in history as the Donation of Constantine. Get you an encyclopedia, like I said, it's there in the book. Okay? I don't be making up stuff that you that one cannot come behind me and do research. Okay? I cannot go before the whole world and walk up on the world platform and say, Hi world, there's never been a man that ever walked to earth in human form of any race, creed, or color by the name of Jesus Christ. I better know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> and I better have some history to back up what I'm talking about. Okay? So, so uh uh it's known in history as the donation of Constantine. He says, uh, Sylvester, if you accept this donation, I will give you my imperial emblems over your people, the Coptic Egyptian. Okay? And all I want from you is for you to baptize me in your African community and make me part of you all. Okay? That's, all, that's what he wanted to do. And said, you, I'm going to give you my authorities where you can be the H-N-I-C of the Coptic community. Anybody, everybody know what H-N-I-C means? Yeah. Okay. You don't, you, do you want me to say it? No. You don't want me to say it? Okay. No, I ain't going to say it. My wife said don't say it. Can he say it? Yeah, go ahead. What does it mean? Head nigga in charge. Head nigga in charge. Oh, okay. <laughs> H-N-I-C. Okay? So, he made Sylvester accept that. It's known in history as the donation of Constantine. Okay? Uh, 313, 314. That's when it happened. Then Arius, a Coptic Egyptian brother, comes along and says, well, hold it. He says, he makes a strong statement after that donation was given and accepted by Sylvester I. He says, this image, we're talking about Serapa, he says, when you read the, the Arius statement, they're going to say Christ. Because see, they have taught the world that this Jesus Christ was born during the time of Herod and died in 30 AD. This is tradition. So they're going to have to use the term Christ when they talk about Arius. Okay? But it was Serapis. He said, this is what he said about Serapis. He said, Serapis is a created creature, listen to this, a created creature dissimilar from the Father. Who is the Father? Osiris! That's the Father. When, you, when, you, when, you, when people talk about God, this is God. See? That's God they're talking about. But they don't, they tell you that this is the Son of God. They don't even mention Osiris. You see that? They tell you that this is the Son of God. And you Christians sit up there and, and don't say nothing. They, say, they tell you Christians say, 
God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save the, the world from sin. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Now, his only begotten son is a European white man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh? Is that right? Brother Shabazz, mm -hmm. Brother Clemson, and all the other brothers, including myself, we can't be the son of God. Because we, we, we don't have no long, blonde, flowing hair. <laughs> we have no blue eyes. <laughs> we're not white. We're not European. Only Europeans should be the son of God. Mm -hmm. He said, I sent my only begotten son. That means that when Shabazz, thinking that he is the son of God, he's going go to he gonna die and, and go up to heaven to be with the, his, his, his father God, he's going to be met. By security guard. <laughs> <laughs> they're they gonna say, Who did you come to see? I came to see my father. Who is your father? God is my father. Mm -mm, no, no. They're gonna get an intercom. Oh, God. <laughs> There's a Negro out here <laughs> who says that he's your son. And God gonna say, You know damn well I don't have no Negro as no son of God. Huh? Chinese can't be the son of God either, can they? Mexican can't be no son of God, only the European. Is that right? So, but the, the Christians don't say nothing. They sit up there and say, mm hmm, that's right, brother. Talking about Reverend Timmy Wing. He preaches all this old garbage out to him, and they agree with it. You see that? But uh, uh, Aria said that this image was a created creature. Dissimilar from the father, the father being Osiris. Where's uh, the father being Osiris in the ancient Egyptian divine triad? You see that? Uh, the triad consists of Osiris the father, Isis, the holy Hathor cow mother, and Horus Jr., the S U N. That's the son. But now, they put uh, at, at the council of Nasir. Well, yes, but we're going to get there in a moment. Iris said that this creature here, Osirapus, was a created creature, dissimilar from the Father, I mean, not like the Father. A perfect creature, but a creature nevertheless. And that caused the Council of Nicaea, those three things, the Donatistic controversy, the strong, uh, I mean, the donation of Constantine, Constantine and the strong statement by Arius caused that council meeting to come about. Okay? Constantine had nothing to do with it. A lot of people think Constantine, he didn't call it, he had no authority. Why didn't he have no authority? He was a member of the Coptic Melkite community. He had been baptized because he gave away his authority. You see that? So he didn't call it, he had no authority to do that. He just sat there and presided over presided over the, 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 the function. It was the male Kai Coptic Egyptians called the Council of Nicaea I to come about in 325. And when they called that council meeting, they took this image of Serapis and went into the ancient Egyptian divine triad, the one I just mentioned, and took out Horus Jr., the S-U-N, and they put it in this thing here. Serapis, known today as Jesus the Christ, as a son of God. Now who is God? Osiris. See? You see that? Took and put the S-O-N in there. A white image. You see? Have you ever heard the, the term that Christ, Jesus the Christ, is the son of man? Mm -hmm. That's true. Because man cannot make anything with life in it by himself. He can't do that. Is that right? So therefore, only, 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 man can only make creatures. Mm. See? So this is a creature. That's what Osiris, I mean, uh, uh, Arius. Arius said. Said this is a, a creature <laughs> dissimilar from the Father. A perfect creature, but a creature nevertheless. You see that? See this thing? Is deep. See, you're going to church and sitting in the pews, you don't have to think. They don't want you to think. Just believe. Have faith. 
If you ask too many questions, they're going to say, Sister, you're not ready. We're going to pray for you. Yeah. <laughs> hmm? See that? See, 921 years they argued over whether this thing had a human nature or not. So that was uh, the first council meeting that, that ever came about, religious council meeting that ever came about in world history. Okay? Now, you go up 56 years later to the council, let me go back, at the council of Nasir Wan, they made this image and created what is known as the Apostles' Creed known as the Homogeneous Creed. See? The Homogeneous Creed goes like this. God the Father, God the Son, the same. So they put this thing in there in the ancient Egyptian divine triad with Osiris and Isis and said they're all three of the same. God the Father, God the Son, the same. That's the Homogeneous Creed. And they took this Homogeneous Nicene Creed Apostles' Creed, 56 years later, and enforced it as being the creed of the Roman government. And wanted our Coptic Egyptian ancestors to abide by it. And we refused to do that. See, so that was in 381, uh, when the council, the second council meeting was called, to make <coughs> official the Homogeneous Nicene Creed the Apostle Creed of the Roman government, called the Council of Constantinople I, 381. Now, let me bring you up to the, the, the most important council meeting that has ever existed on planet Earth, called the Council of Ephesus. It's in my book. The Council of Ephesus was, was called and brought about in 431 A.B.C.E. What caused it to come about? See, all these council meetings was caused to come about. They just didn't jump up and say, we're going to have a council meeting tomorrow morning. Uh-uh. Something was happening out there in the Coptic co community. See, they, they wanted to get our grassroots Coptic Egyptians to accept this image. This is all part of that argument. You see? Now, What's the name of this image up until the Council of Ephesus? Serapis. You had two Coptic Egyptian brothers, one by the name of Eutyches. Eutyches is the father of monophysitism. Monophysitism uh, goes like this. They, the monophysites refuse to accept a human nature for this thing here. Because Osiris, I mean, uh, Arius, Arius, said that this thing was a created creature, right? Yeah. And he calls what is known in history as Aaronism. Mm. Looking, oh, yeah. you want to look up Aaronism? Look at, get your encyclopedia. They tell you about it. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Jamila? <laughs> That's right. She knows. Okay? You got that? Now, <clears throat> So Eutychus is the father of monophysitism, which means a monophysite refused to recognize the human nature of this thing here that we know today as Jesus the Christ, then known as Serapis. Then there was a, the, the second brother was, uh, that came along, uh, Nestorius. At the same time that Eutychus came along with monophysitism, and you, uh, uh, Nestoria said that the Virgin Mary, uh, with the attachment of the Theotokos attached to her, that he could, could not recognize the Theotokos in the Virgin Mary. The Theotokos means the mother of God. That's what the word Theotokos means. Look it up. Now, so what they did, the Melchite Coptic Egyptians, call a council meeting that's known in history as the Council of Ephesus. To do what? To get this thing here a human nature. That's what it was called for. In order to have a human nature, one has to be born through the body of a female. 
You cannot be born through the body of a dog to get a human nature. Is that right? So they had to get this thing a mother. So what they did, these Uncle Tom, male Kite, Coptic Egyptians, they went into the ancient Egyptian divine triad again. Now, at the Council of Nicaea 1, 325, they had taken uh, uh, Horace Jr. out, the S-U-N, and put in the S-O-N, this thing here, right? Now they're going into the ancient Egyptian divine triad, and they're taking Isis out. And they created a created creature to take her place. You know the name of that created creature? The Virgin Mary. This is history. It don't, Christianity does not go according to the tradition that they have taught the world. It don't go like that. See, this is, I'm talking about the other side of the coin now. History, human history. Now, when they took this Virgin Mary out of the ancient Egyptian I'm sorry, when he took uh, Isis out of the ancient Egyptian divine triad and put this created creature, the Virgin Mary, in, gave this created creature, the Virgin Mary, a title of Theotokos, which means the mother of God. Okay? They gave this Virgin Mary the attributes of Isis. Okay? That's the key. They gave, when they made Ptolemy one Lagis uh, image and two this Serapis image, they gave this Ptolemy the attributes of Osiris. See? So now, here you have the same thing being done to Isis. Giving her a title of Theotokos. This is what uh, Nestorius fought against. You see that? So what happened there were three brothers, three Coptic Egyptian Africans. And you check this out, Jamila. Ask anybody about the three chapters. That's known. You ever heard of the three chapters? Okay. It's called the three chapters. It's all history. The three chapters was written by uh, three African Coptic Egyptians, but they were male kites. To, to kind of... Uh, and, and, uh, and oppose uh, the Nestorians and uh, the Monophysites at the Council of Ephesus. You see? Now, when they made the Virgin Mary to be the mother of God, and God is Serapis, and they amalgamated the two created creatures together, and they came out with the Anointed One. And the Coptic Egyptian speaking Greek said that this is the Christos. In English, the Christos mean that now this is the Christ. That's how this Jesus, this Christ came about. With that amalgamation of the created creatures, the Virgin Mary, with the Theotokos title on, attached to her, which means the mother of God and amalgamating the two created creatures, the rapers together. You see that? And the Coptic Egyptians said, now this is the anointed one. This is the Christos. And the Christos, they were speaking Greek. And English means, now this is the Christ. That's how it happened. You see? So now, so Nestorius said that he, didn't, he couldn't recognize that, that, that Theotokos. Eutychus, the monophysite, said, no, I'm not recognizing no human nature and no Christ. I don't care what you do. I'm not going to accept it. So now, uh, they had three Coptic Egyptian brothers, old Uncle Tom, who wrote opposing letters against Nestorius and Eutychus at that council meeting. And it is known in history, it's in my book, as the three chapters. The three chapters written by these African brothers, uh, Theodore of Mopsu Essia, and Theodore of Sar. C-Y-R, and Ibis of Odessa, okay, wrote what is known in history as the three chapters. You go and get you uh, to the library and, and get you a set of uh, uh, the, the new Catholic encyclopedias. 
and you look up the three chapters in there, it's in there. Mm -hmm. See that? Mm -hmm. It's in there, Jamila. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, these was opposing letters written at this council meeting. So now, what you have going on, you have two factions now. You have the, the, the monophysites who said that this image that we know today as Jesus Christ uh, was a created creature, had no human nature. And the, now you have diaphysitic Christians. The word diaphysitic means an individual who recognized the two natures in Christ. Diaphysitic. Okay? It's in my book. Now we come up 20 years later to another very important council meeting called the Council of Chalcedon, 451. The argument is still going on. <laughs> argument is still going on. They're trying to make and create a human nature still for this thing here. Okay? And they use those, those three uh, opposing letters that was used at the Council of Ephesus at the Council of Chalcedon. Plus, guess what they did to get this thing a human nature? They used one word. You know what that word, the word is? Consubstantiality. The word consubstantiality means a person. That's what it means. Now if you are a person, that means what? You're a human being. You see that? So, in order to be a person, you are automatically a human being. So they use that word consubstantiality and apply it to this thing in their dogmatic decrees written to repudiate the argument that from the monophysites saying that this thing here had no human nature. They use that one word, consubstantiality, which means person. See? Now, I don't know nobody is telling you these things about what happened at these council meetings. Mm -hmm. You see? So now, we're going to move. Now, the argument is still going on now. We're going to move from 351, I mean 451, I'm sorry. Council, at, at, the, close, at the close of the council of Chelsea Don in 451, Guess what officially began? Christianity. Officially began. So anybody tells you, come up and tell you about a, a, a Christ before the Council of Ephesus in 431, they're historically incorrect. Anybody tell you about uh, Christianity before the close of the Council of Chalcedon, they're historically incorrect. Anybody come up and tell you about a Christian church being in existence before uh, 532 and 37, they're historically incorrect. We're going to get to that. Now, we're going we're gonna to leave from Chelsea Don. That was the fourth council meeting that happened in world history. Okay? Now, you, uh, are you following me so, thus far? You see how this argument and how this creature was created? Okay? This is the progression of history. Okay? Now, if we go up to the time of the Byzantine ruler by the name of Zeno. Zeno Zeno's time uh, came about uh, 474 to 491. That was his time of rule. And he tried to uh, reconcile the two uh, feuding factions together, meaning the diaphysitics and uh, the monophysite. Okay, all these are Coptic Africans now. He's trying to reconcile, reconcile them. And there was a man that was a Coptic Egyptian by the name of, of uh, Achaeus. Okay? Acacius, I'm sorry, Acacius. It's all in history. He wrote a dogmatic decree for Zeno. And it is known in history what he wrote is called the Hinatican. See, this is history, world history. The Hinatican. This is Hinatican degree is supposed to have reconciled the two factions, the diaphysitic <coughs> and, and, and the, the monophysites. Okay? Now, what 
the Hanada can consist of. It ties in and unifies and give uh, credence and credit to and definition to the first four council meetings. Uh, Nicaea 1, 325, Constantinople 1, 381, Ephesus, Council of Ephesus, 431, and the Council of Chalcedon, 451. And with one word in there, in all these uh, uh, four council meetings, in this dogmatic decree called the Hinnatican, with one word in there, consubstantiality. <laughs> Tied it all in, in the Hinnatican. But they never mention the word person in there. See? So he tried to get the two factions to agree to the Hanadikan. He said, no, no way, I'm not going to do that. So the feud went on. You see that? The feud went on. Until you come to uh, uh, Zeno's time was 474 to 491. And 482 is when he issued the Hanadikan that Akashius had wrote for him, this Coptic Egyptian. So you go up from 491 at the end of the rule of Zeno, and you come up to an, 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 an Atashius I, okay? Uh, uh, the succeeding Byzantine ruler after Zeno, okay? Uh, his time was 491 to 518. He did something that's going to set up something later in history. What he did over there, he stopped the gladiator competition over there in the stadium of the Hippodrome. The gladiator competition over there was just like football over in America. So if, if, suppose, suppose we have a president to stop an abolished football. This country would go up in, in, in smoke, wouldn't it? That's the same thing that happened over there with those demons over there. The percentages the Venetians and the Persini, called the, 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 the Greens and the Blues. They were opposing factions. They set it at the opposite end of, 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 the, of the Hippodrome. And they had colors, just like the ball clubs today, having different uniforms with their color emblems on it. Mm -hmm. These, these demons did the same thing. See? And when he stopped the gladiator competition in Constantinople, because now Constantinople is a walled city. Okay? And uh, when he stopped that, that's when all hell broke out. Okay? Now, we come up to the time, I'm, just I'm setting you up. Come up to the time to the successor of an, an, an Anastasius I. We come up to the time of Justin I, who took control of the Byzantine Empire after the death of Anastasius I in 518. We're talking about 518 for Justin I to uh, 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 532 for Justin, mm -hmm. okay? And he kept the enforcement of no gladiator competition can be uh, played out in the Hippodrome. So they grumbling. these these uh, white folks, and these white folks like in this kind of game, it was a savage game. You know what gladiator competition mean, don't you? Mm -hmm. They have those long old poles and they ride on a horse and they poke each other and kill each other until they, until they die, you know. So we don't deal with nothing like that. The savages. So, <clears throat> anyway, he kept that in place until he died and his nephew, Justinian I, and his wife Theodora took over the Byzantine Empire. This is where the good stuff comes in. Okay? Now you still had the argument over whether this Christ had a human nature. It hadn't gone away. They argued over this thing having a human nature for 921 years. So what Justinian did in 532, he commissioned African architects and African builders to build the world's first Christian church known as the Church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, Turkey.
that church and university, which is the world's first university for European white men, didn't allow women to come in there. Okay? The church and the university was staffed by African teachers. So, if you want to see, like I said before, Europeans did not develop in Europe. Why? They had, they had no writing system. No writing system, you cannot have no institution. You see that? So they developed there in Africa. In, beginning with the Hagia Sophia, they had, the African uh, uh, teachers taught them. Now this is the world's first Christian church, right? Built by, commissioned by the, uh, uh, Justin and his wife Theodora in 532, finished five years later. The picture of the Hagia Sophia is right here on my book, the cover. But you see these minarets on there. That was put on there many, many years later, over a thousand years later. Now, uh, when they finished building uh, the Church of Hagia Sophia, you know what date it was? December the 27th, 537. Hmm. And my wife writes a very important chapter in the historical origin of Islam book on what happened to the church of Hagia Sophia. <coughs> now, I said, now, listen to this now. People ask me, why does this Christ uh, have a birthday on December the 25th? <coughs> the birth of Christ, having a birthday attached to him, or this image, this creature, because of the Hagia Sophia, the finishing of the Hagia Sophia, December the 27th. And see, for 900 and uh, for over 900 years, they celebrated on that same date, Jamila. They celebrated the same date every December the 27th to celebrate that building of that church and the creation of the church of Hagia Sophia. The word, uh, it was also known as the Holy Church of the Holy Wisdom. Mm -hmm. Another name for Jesus the Christ. That's, and when, when they moved Christianity to Europe, due to the Gregorian calendar, they lost two days. So you have December 25th. Sure. Mm -hmm. See that? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. They're clever. <laughs> well, see, Reverend Chickaming, he don't know, he never tell you this, he don't know this. <laughs> see that? See? So now, for over 900 years, they celebrated the same day. They dressed up, just like they do for Christmas, here, for, for Christ Mass. Okay? They dress up for it. See? They give gifts, and so forth and so on. Celebration that day. The birthday of, 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 of Christ yeah. attached to that church. Ritual. Is that something? Mm. Is that something? Whoa. So now, so, but now, Justinian wanted to take back the donation of Constantine from the Melchite Coptic Egyptian. That will give him the ecclesiastical of power and authority over that church. That's what he wanted. He didn't want that power to be in the hands of no, of no Africans. See? He wanted to have the ecclesiastical authority as well as the political authority. But it was in the hands of the Coptic Egyptian. So now, he needs to get that out away from them, right? They refused to do that. Now, when he built that church in 532, there was a Coptic Egyptian who had the donation of Constantine by the name of Agapetus I. In order to get that donation from him, so he thought he killed, he had Agapetus I killed. Okay? Had him murdered. And then 
the, uh, the, uh, the Malachite Coptic Egyptian appointed another brother by the name of Silverius I to take his place after the death of Agapetus I. And Justinian uh, had his army general to, and his wife to, to, to take treason papers and serve on him. Say, you, are, you have, you, you, you have uh, uh, committed treason against the government. Okay? And they got rid of him, thinking that they can take back the donation of Constantine. Uh-uh. Then they uh, came to power with Vigilius, because the Coptic Egyptians, after Silverius, was uh, uh, dismissed. The power of the donation of Constantine rested in the hand of Vigilius. Okay? And uh, in 543, and Uncle Tom, it's always a Negro around, gonna tell white folks how to do other Negroes. You know what I mean? Uh huh. They all, there's always some Armstrong Williamses around. You know, you, know, you remember Armstrong Williams, don't you? Okay, you know what he did, don't you? Okay. Here come Theodore Asidus, a lawyer, a Coptic Egyptian Malachite lawyer, told a Justinian how to take back that donation of Constantine. He said, what you do, you get, uh, what you do, you uh, oppose the three chapters. Now, going back to that three chapters again now. You denounce the three chapters. Now, the three chapters was, a, was, was, a, was letters written by these three African bishops, Theodore, Theodore Red, and Ivers of Odessa against the Nestorians and the Monophysite. But now Justinian said, denounce that, that these three chapters was wrong, okay? And get Vigilius to take up communion with the Monophysites. See? So Vigilius said, no, I'm not going to do all that what you're talking about. Uh-uh, you think I'm a fool, don't you? See? So that didn't work. So they called the council of Constantinople II. You see that? Constantinople II, 553. And uh, right after that council meeting, they found Vigilius mysteriously dead. <laughs> Killed him. So therefore, they took back to, uh, Justinian took back the donation of Constantine. And he became the ecclesiastical authority over the Hagia Sophia. And he was able to appoint whomever he wanted, like the bishop. He, he appointed the patriarch of the Hagia Sophia were all Africans. So your first popes of the Roman Catholic Church, see the Hagia Sophia was the Roman Catholic Church. The, the, the Catholic means universal church, okay? And all Africans were appointed popes of that church, of the papas, you see? And uh, he began to appoint uh, the patriarch of the Hagia Sophia. You see that? Uh, Pelagius I became one of his first appointees. Uh, John III, another brother, African brother, became his second appointee after the uh, Pelagius time went out. Okay? And the Hagia Sophia represented Rome. You see? Represented the West. So whoever sat as the uh, patriarch of the Hagia Sophia was also the, the, the Pope of Rome. Okay? That's history. You see? So now, uh, he has in his power the ecclesi ecclesiastical authority. The patriarch of Constantinople was always a monophysite. See? It's in my books. See? 
So you you so so from from then on, from just in and on, ecclesiastical authority was in the hands of the Byzantine rulers, taken out of the male kites. Okay? Coptic Egyptian. See? Then we're gonna go up to we're gonna fast forward. And I hope I'm not boring you all. Mm -mm. We come up to Heracles or Heraclius I. Okay. By Gilead's time was uh, from uh, 527 to 565. So now from 565, uh, we're coming into the time of Heracles. Uh, the Melkite Coptic Egyptians and the Diophysite City Christians are still fighting what? Over what? The human nature of Christ. Still fighting. Okay? So Heracles has another brother by the name of Sergius I, an African, to draw some other, another degree trying to reconcile the two factions together. Okay? And that decree is known in history as the Thesis, or Ecthias, I'm sorry, Ecthias. E-C-T-H-I-S, Ecthias. Okay? And that was supposed to reconcile the, the two uh, feuding factions over the human nature of this Christ. Okay? But that didn't work either. That didn't work. So now, uh, we come up to the time of, of, of Constantine III and Constance II taking over the Byzantine Empire after Heracles. And they uh, brought up another decree. Now, the, e, e, the Ecthias is a decree based on monothelitism and monothelitism. Tell you the difference. Monothelit means one will. Monothelit, L-I-T, means one energy. See? They're saying, let's not be so harsh in saying that this Christ had no human nature. Let's say he had one will. Let's say he had one energy. You see that? See, you go into church, you're not going to learn all of this. Huh? You're sitting up there. Huh? You don't know nothing. You see that? When, I tell, when the person tells you that he's a Christian, he knows nothing about himself and knows nothing about Christianity. So they tried, they took these two words, Heracles, under this new theology created by Sergius I, a Coptic Egyptian, called the Ecthias. The two words was monothelitism, L-E-T, which means one will, and monothelitism, which means one energy. So let's say that, instead of no human nature. So harsh, you all. See? So the country just said, no, I'm not accepting that either. <laughs> okay? Not going to accept it. Okay? So, <clears throat> what he went on and did made the Ecthias uh, the creed of the Byzantine government. Okay? He tried to use those terms to appease the Europeans as well as the diaphoretic Christians in uh, Africa. I'm going to change the state. Okay. Theology. It's not just history. history. Huh? It's just history. Right. We back. Which is okay. Now, <laughs> after uh, the Melkites and uh, the Monophysites couldn't get together in agreement on these two terms. Monothelitism, one will, monothelitism, one energy. Heracles, like I said, made this a, made it into a law. It was done to appease 
uh, the Europeans in the West, the mm -hmm. Christian in the West, and the diaphasitic African Christian there in Africa. Okay? Didn't work. So here comes the successor of Heraclius, Constantine III and Constance II. Okay? Uh, Constance II, they were co-rulers, but Constance II had Constantine III killed to get him out of the way so he can rule. The Europeans, are, you know, they do anything to get power, kill their mama. Now, Constance II said, we're going to throw out monothelitism and monothelitism. We don't, we're not going to talk about no one will. We're not going to talk about no one energy. We're going to erase it. We're going to throw it out. And he issued a decree called the Typus. T-Y-P-U-S of T-Y-P-O-S. It's in my book. He issued that decree. See? So, but that didn't settle anything. Okay? Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit, not too far. We're going to come up time to Philippicus. Something happened. Something happened. Okay? Something happened. But before I get to Philippicus, let's go back to Justinian. We're talking about 527 to 565. When, during the reign of Justinian, Two or three things important really happened. Well, one, he built the Church of Hagia Sophia. Remember me telling you about that? Now he had to deal with the unrest of the Europeans living in Constantinople because they were forbidden to use or practice the sport of the gladiator? what? Was that the gladiator? The gladiator competition. They began an uprise during his reign, and he was. Uh, he was about to abduct and, and run away from his, his authority. He had prepared a boat to leave Constantinople, and his wife Theodore said, no, you don't do that. He said, you go and get your army general, Mansurius, and, and you bring down this riot. So his army general took 30,000 men, women, and children and marched them into that hippodrome and killed them. And that is a blood bath. It brought down that ride. And that ride is known in history as the Nika ride. N-I-K-K-A. You ever heard of that? No, you haven't. I understand that. And the word Nika, N-I-K-K-A, means conquer. Greek conquer. Okay? And after he brought that ride down and things began to settle, he already built a Hagia Sophia. <coughs> Then, uh, a, a, a rich merchant in Constantinople by the name of Harif Ibn Gabala came to Theodora, and watch this now, and said, I want you to send someone to evangelize among uh, the Arabs or the Europeans then. And she went and picked her <coughs> hand-picked Uncle Tom, Negro Coptic Egyptian, by the name of Jacob Barodeus, known also, AKA, as Jacob Barodey. Okay? And uh, she commissioned him to get a group together to evangelize among the Europeans. Okay? And he got, uh, he got about 120. Uh, clergymen, uh, 170 really, clergymen, including women. See, the women over there were nuns. See, they, they, they practiced celibacy. See, both, all of the Coptic Egyptians, whether they were Melkite or whether they were Monophysite, they practiced what is known as celibacy. And that's the reason why those women, those African Coptic Egyptian women, were called nuns. They didn't practice, they didn't use, they didn't have sex, you know. And that's, that's where you get the practice of celibacy, supposedly in the Roman Catholic Church, which you know that's a big joke. 
with all those fags running around, you know, <laughs> flushing babies down toilets and stuff. Anyway, uh, uh, she got this Coptic Egyptian. Now, you know, remember me saying during the time of uh, Ptolemy I Lagi, when they refused to accept his image as a god throughout Egypt, he closed all those temples down and forbid any of the African Coptic Egyptians to build any temples. Okay? Because the Melkite Copts used the facility that uh, the Byzantine rulers provided for them. So they were, those are the Uncle Tom Copts. So now she goes over and gets Jacob Baradez and she builds, had him a, a, a headquartered building built in Syria. Today, you know what that, that, that building is called? The Jacobite Church. The Jacobite Church. Named enough for Jacob Bardet. See? This is all history. And they began to evangelize among the Europeans over there. Thus causing them, uh, and they are known in history as the Arabs. See, those are your first Arabs. You see? But let me get back to Philippicus. This is, oh man, this is great here. Philippicus, now, the argument was over, the argument was over always over the human nature of this thing here, right? So now, Philippicus did something. See, they were usurping each other, those Byzantine, uh, European white men. They were usurping, usurping, usurping each other so bad that, and so fast that you didn't know who the ruler was. And you may wake up in the morning, maybe Henry Jones. The next day, means Thomas Johnson. You see? So, Philippicus came along and had his picture painted and put all, out all over Constantinople. Say, I'm the new ruler. And all throughout the Byzantine Empire. Now what happens to a picture? When you look at a picture, a picture, the old adage says what now? A picture is worth over a thousand words, right? So when they look at a picture of a man, you think that, that the image or the icon that's drawn as a man is a man, right? Okay? The bright idea was, uh, was thought of by uh, the patriarch Gregory of the Hagia Sophia said that we can take, we can paint Christ's picture like that. Ah, you see that? And we can, we can show that Christ has a human nature. You see that? So when you see this picture of this thing here, you, you, you say that's a man, right? That was done, that was caused by Philip Picos. He didn't do that on purpose. But this Coptic African brother, who was the patriarch of the Hagia Sophia, said, Hi, we can do this by painting Christ's picture. And show that Christ was a man. You see that? To show that Christ has a human nature. Mm -hmm. The argument is still going on whether this image had a human nature or not between the monophysites and the diaphysitics. You see that? No, not today. I'm talking about then. Okay, I'm, talking, I'm showing you the progression of history, how this thing came about to be what it is today. That's what I'm explaining. Now, when uh, Philippicus was in power from 711 to 717, and then the Leo III came in as the Byzantine ruler. And he came in because his empire was still under argument between the diaphysics and the, and the monophysites. He said, we're going to cut this out. So he had two African brothers to write up a decree. Constantine the Black and another brother wrote up a decree known today in history as iconoclasm. 
Iconoclasm means the breaking of images. In other words, we're going to break this image. We're going to destroy that image. So Leo had all those images taken down that this Gregory had, had commissioned to be painted, to put around Constantinople. Because Gregory had no authority to do that, right? Because he, was, he didn't have the ecclesiastical authority was in the hands of the Byzantine ruler. Not him. So he had no authority to do that. Leo was mad as hell. And they took all those images down and brought together a dogmatic decree written by these African brothers called iconoclasm, the breaking of images. That's what it means. Okay? Now, that was to appease the monophysites. You know, you're all cool down, everything's cool. In the meantime, let's move a little further after Leo III. At the death of Leo III, uh, his son took power, Leo IV. And he had a wife by the name of Irene. Not the one on the record said, good night, Irene. Not that one. <laughs> he had another Irene. This is Irene of, of history. Guess what Irene did? Because there were certain men in the Byzantine government who did not like what Leo did with iconoclasm. Okay? And they got together with Irene and said, we'll make you the head of the government. And guess what she had to do? She had a, her husband killed in order for her to have that power. And they had a 10-year-old son, and she, the power was supposed to went to the 10-year-old son. The 10-year-old son can't rule no government, so she took it over. She became known in history as the Empress Irene. And guess what she did? She called the Council of Nicaea II to come about. You ever heard of the Council of Nicaea II? See, you don't hear nothing about You hear about one, yeah. but you don't hear about two. Now we're going to talk about two. It's called the Iconoclasticism con uh, Council Meeting, 787. See? It's in my book, Historical Origin of Islam. 787. She called that council meeting to be. Okay? So called the uh, Council of Nicaea II. And in that council meeting, <coughs> she uh, had her, uh, her, her, her stooges on staff with her to write up dogmatic decrees against iconoclasm in favor of iconoclasm. You see that? This is what she did. And Long story short, in, in, the, in those degree, decrees, those decrees was written to give and make this Christ God now. This is where Christ became God. At the, at the, at the Council of Nicaea II. And guess what else they created there? They created saints. In other words, if you want to talk to God, you've got to go through saints. Now, see, all this is History. See how you see all sank this and sank that. It's not that easy. It didn't come about like that. You got to go back in history. These these was the the, the the saints, the angels and so forth. You got to they was used as inter intermediators between you the human being. If you want to get to Christ, give Christ a message so you can get a blessing. Pray. <laughs> you got <to> <laughs> right. Oh, you, you got smart. <laughs> see. So now. This is what they did at, at, at this council meeting. You see that? So now, after Irene went out, um, you could, fast forward, we're going to come up to the time of Phocius. You ever heard of Phocius? Called the Phocius Philoquy Controversy. See? We're talking about eight. 69 and 870. See? The Phocius Philoquy controversy. 
Phocius was a Greek speaking Coptic Egyptian African. And this is what got Phocius in, 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 problem, in, 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 in trouble. Bardeus, who was a uh, Byzantine ruler, appointed him to be the, the, the patriarch of Constantinople. Like I said, patriarch of Constantinople represent monophysitism. The patriarch of the Hagia Sophia represented Diophysitic Christianity. Okay? So now, Phocius came along and they rushed him through the procedures to be a patriarch. They set a new president. And the, 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 the patriarch of the Hagia Sophia, another brother, resented that. Okay? So what Phocius did, he retaliated by saying that number one, he refused to ne recognize the patriarch of the Hagia Sophia, the Pope of the Hagia Sophia. He refused to recognize him and his authority. You know, I don't recognize you. You're just another nigga. <laughs> Do of a better word. Then the second thing he didn't do, he refused to recognize the philoquy in the creed. Now see how they set you up? Instead of saying he refused to recognize Christ in the creed, they said the philoquy. They used the word philoquy in place of Christ. Slick. It sounds, it sounds, it, it won't wake you up. It won't wake the Christians up. He said philoquy, they don't know what the hell philoquy is. Because it took me a long time to find the meaning of philoquy. I had to look and search and look. You know? It's not, you can't go to a regular Webster dictionary and look up philoquy. Uh-uh. But see, those words are used to, to, to keep the Christians from being alarmed and awakened. He refused to recognize the philoquy in the creed. The philoquy means he refused to recognize Christ in the creed. What creed? The creed that was set up at the, con uh, at the Council of Nicaea I when they took this image of Serapis and inserted it in the creed and made it part of the Nicene Coptic Egyptian creed of Osiris, Isis, and Horus, the S-U-N. He, he refused to recognize it. Still arguing now. This is 8, 8, 60, uh, eight uh, 69 and 870. Argument still going on. From 320 BC all the way up until, now you opened uh, over 800 years of argument over this, whether this thing had a human nature or not. You see that? You see? So, and then the third thing he refused to do, he refused to practice celibacy. He said, I'm not going to practice no celibacy, man. All these fine chicks around me. You think I'm a damn fool? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> he refused to do that. See? So they called another council meeting for him. <laughs> the Council of Constantinople Four. That was to admonish Phocius, <laughs> but he held on, you know. So let me uh, fast forward a little bit, and then we're going to come to the end of my presentation. And uh, we're going to go into the time of the Crusades. All this has something to do with Christianity. The crusade started, uh, the first crusade was 1096. All crusades took place where? I didn't ask you, but anyway, it took place in Africa. <laughs> See, people think crusades was in Europe, no. Mm -mm. It's, in, it's in Africa, known today as the Middle East. Okay? That's where the crusades were. Alexis I, Comentos. He was a uh, Byzantine emperor. After the Seljukian Turks 
began to cause trouble for his, for the Byzantine Empire and the Byzantine Empress. The Seljukian Turks erupted out of Iran in 1071. Okay, A.C.E. And they began to disrupt the rhythm and uh, the power of the Byzantine Empress and that Byzantine Empire. So what they did, see these, these uh, those uh, Seljukian Turks was fierce fighters. And they would call, uh, these uh, uh, Byzantine rulers would call to Europe for mercen European mercenaries to come in to help them fight the Seljukian Turks. So this is what caused the crusade to come about. And when he called for help to the West to send uh, troops over there to save, now this is what history, tradition history said, to save Christendom. <laughs> Damn lie. Mm -mm. Those crusaders was not coming over there, he wanted them to come over there to save his empire. Not no Christianity. And those crusaders come and, come and came over there not to save his empire either. They came over there looking for land that they can take and claim their own. Right. Okay? So, in 1096, you had Peter the Hermit. You ever heard of Peter the Hermit? And Walter the Penniless. Peter the Hermit came out of France. Walter the Penniless came out of Italy. They came over there, supposedly. By the time they got over there, <laughs> they had been inter in intercepted by so many different factions that they came over there with a little ragged group of men. Okay? But in the meantime, uh, the rich barons began to send uh, troops over there. Men over there, armies over there. Why did the rich barons want to go over there in that land? To get land for themselves. Yeah. See? And these Byzantine rulers are going to get these men, these, uh, these, the, the head of the, the armies that came over there, said, now, yeah, when you confiscate some land and defeat these, these, these Turks, you give it back to me. Now, here, and say, oh, yeah, we're going to do that. Shh. Like hell. Yeah. So what happened? Uh, Solomon Bar Isaac, Karl Rashi, the man that formulated the protocols for Judaism and for the, the conduct of, of the rich barons, okay, sent an army over there under the leadership of Godfrey of Debulian and his brother Baldwin. They came out of the north of France. And then another Byzantine, uh, I'm sorry, another uh, rich baron sent uh, Raymond with another army from Toulouse, all coming out of France, out of the southern part of France, Toulouse, France. And then another army was led by and commanded by Stephen of Blois, B-O-L-I-S, Blois, France. And then you had Bohemian coming out of Italy. Those are the four barren armies coming into and during the time of the Crusades. Okay? Into Northeast Africa, into Turkey, and the surrounding areas. See that? They, they, went, they didn't come over there to save no Christian, Christi, Christian doom. They didn't come over there to save no uh, land and defeat the Turks for and give back the land to the, to the, the Byzantine rulers. No, no, no. Okay? So, what they did, they came over there and those Turks defeated them. All of those armies. Except for Godfrey and his army that was sent in there by Solomon Bar Isaac called Rashi. When you study uh, the historical origin of Judaism, they'll tell you that Rashi 
is in all Jewish studies. Okay, that's what they tell you. Okay. Now, what in the army of Godfrey were Christian soldiers? Godfrey himself was a Christian. Is that correct, Annetta? The emblem of Godfrey was a red cross with four other red crosses in that big red cross. He had a, little, had a big red cross like that, right? And you had a little cross here, a little cross there, and a little cross here, and a little cross there. That's called the equestrian cross. Okay? Went on to be what? The emblem of the Red Cross that we have today. In his army, you had these Christian soldiers, right? They came over and they seized Jerusalem in 1099. And they built themselves a walled city around Jerusalem. You see that? And they lived inside of the walled city. But they paid their way to stay there. So the, so the, so the Turks would not bother them. They, they, they paid a dehemi tax. See? A dehemi tax is paid to a sovereign power for me to stay where I want to stay on this land, which is your land, without being in the other words, rent. Okay? And those inside that compound that they built, uh, guess what organized within the uh, Godfrey and Baldwin's army? Uh, they began to organize for the very first time um, another mm -hmm. for the very first time they began to organize they're known in history as yes <laughs> please sweetheart okay, the Knights nice Templar the Knights nice Templar oh. The Knights Templars became into being. They first, uh, they came over in 1099 in Jerusalem. And in 1118, they organized themselves and began to call themselves the Knights Templars. Okay, and the Hospitalars was over there too. That's the White Crow. And then, see, <laughs> and then, in 11, 18, 10 years later, they got their emblem, which is the compass. The compass is nothing but two pyramids, one up and one down. Okay? And that, those two pyramids is known today also as the Star of David. Star of David! Okay? One up and one down coming from the Knights nice Templars. They also went on to become uh, the first Mason, Freemason group on earth. Mm -hmm. Scottish Rites. Okay? It's all history. They paid their way over there. They paid their way to stay there. Okay? Then other rich barons began, now listen to this, began to go to them because Solomon by Isaac was a rich Baron out of Trees, France, who was a wine grower, vineyard owner, the one that laid the foundation for Judaism and the protocols for the rich barons. Okay? He said, when you get over there, find this land, any kind of land, and build me a temple. Okay? So his name was Solomon Bar Isaac, called Rashi. So they built a temple of who? Solomon. Solomon inside that wall compound. And then the other rich barons began to do the same thing, having, having uh, 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 these nice Templars to build them uh, temples over there. 
And that's how, from the rich barons giving them money to stay there, that's how they was able to pay their Dehemi tax for 192 years. Until 1291, when the Mamelukes out of Egypt ran them out of there. And they went into the island of Rhodes, they ran into Scotland and began to create what is known as Scottish Rites. That, that's your first, those were your first practitioners of Judaism, the religion. But it wasn't uh, like, it was, like it is today. But that goes into another history. So, then uh, you go into, uh, still with these crusaders coming over there, fighting. It's all in my book, I wrote it down. And, and I, I brought you up to uh, where the Byzantine emperors was uh, uh, segregated and only uh, allowed to operate within the double walled city of Constantinople until Mohammed II came along in, five, in 1453 and took a cannon and blew a hole in the side of the, the city of Constantinople and entered there and took over the Hagia Sophia and made it into a mosque. That's the Hagia Sophia. And before that, uh, John 8, I told you, went into Florence, Italy at the Council of Ferrara and gave up the donation to Constantine and then that's when they moved the seat of Christianity into Europe. And the rest is history. So with that, I'm going to uh, close my lecture out. And if you have any questions, I'll take a few quick questions. We won't linger long. And, uh, and then, you know, we can end my lecture that way. You gotta give me a applause. And then we'll be good. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? This Islam does not come in until the Quran is created. And the Quran was created by Jews. They began to build, I'm sorry, they began to write and create uh, the book that we know today as uh, the Quran. They began to write that book in 1870 in Syria. Okay? You're not listening. 1870 in Syria. Jews, Jewish scholars from France began to create that book. It was the Alliance uh, Israelite Universal of Paris, France, sending a group of, of, of rabbis and scholars and writers into Syria. Because during that time, they had monophysitism. I'm sorry, Mo uh, Mohammedanism. I'm getting a little tired. They're having uh, Mo uh, Mohammedanism then. Okay, it's in my book. But to get to the Islam part, always remember Islam is a religion based upon a book called the Quran. The Quran and the religion called Islam was created by Jews. They created that religion by creating what is known as the Quran, okay, 1870. It took them, as when they began to write and create this book that we know today as the Quran, and it took them 49 years, okay, to complete that book called the Quran, and, 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 and in 1919, the Arabs accepted that book. In 1919 now, after World War I, World War I was from 1914 to 1918. In 1919, the Arab world accepted what is known as the Quran. And they had, guess when they had the first meeting in Islam's history? 1926. It's in my book. I'm the only one that's bringing it out. So the, the crusade wasn't fought between the Muslims and the, and the, and the first crusade was between the Muslims and the Christians? Mm -mm. No, no. That's what tradition says that. History doesn't say that. See, history says that these crusaders came over there. They weren't interested in saving no Christianity. Okay, they, want, they wanted land over there. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important kind of to, to bridge us a little bit. But they were 
being they were paying a toll or dehemi to whom? I think it's important that you. They was paying a dehemi to the Turks, to the Seljukian Turks of the of the of, of, of the uh, Ottoman Turks over there. Okay, that's who they was paying a dehemi to. Like I told you, the word dehemi means a tax. And then uh, those uh, those those uh, later years, those uh, nice Templars became dehemi bankers. Okay, they collected the taxes for the capitalists who loaned money to the rich monarchs and merchants over in Europe. And they they became tax tax collectors. They were called dehemi tax collectors. And Jesse Jackson called them Hymies. <laughs> okay. And you see, you spell Dehemi, D-H-I-M-M-I. -M -M okay. If you take the D away and you put in place of the I, you put Y in there, still I and Y is the same, interchangeable. You got uh, Hymie. Okay. So that's how the Quran came about. It's, without the Quran, you have no Islam. And the Jews wrote the Quran and created the religion called uh, Islam by creating the Quran. And that Quran, it took them 49 years to complete and accepted by the Arab world in 1919 in Cairo, Egypt. Those Jewish writers and scholars were sent over there by the Alliance Universal of Paris, France, sent them over there to do that. Okay? And the first meeting in Islam's history was 1926. Mm -hmm. The uh, components of the uh, uh, of, uh, of the uh, oh, I am sleeping too. Right. <laughs> uh, the components of the uh, book, um, the Muslim book, the Quran. The components of it. What makes it up? Well, you got surahs in there. Okay. Uh, the surahs means chapters. Well, that, that's what the Jews got that. They got that from the Jews. The Jews wrote that and created the surahs. Instead of chapters, they said surahs. You studied Judaism, they said uh, the surah was in Iraq. Okay? And that uh, uh, they call it in Iraq Babylon. It was in Babylon. That's where uh, the Torah, the center where the Torah was studied. Okay? So I'll put it in my book. So that's one of the aspects. And then they say, see, the first god of Islam was not Allah, it was Raman. The name Raman, the compassionate, preceded every chapter in the Quran created by Jews. And then they dropped Raman and they, they got Allah. And they took Raman and, 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 and boosted Raman up and, and gave him another function. What function is that? Raman. Huh? Ramadan. See? That's what they did. This is history. They made Ramadan out of this. See? Another thing from the Jews. See? The Day of Atonement. Ashura. The Jewish Ashura. Meaning the Day of Atonement. They made Ramadan for the, for the Muslims. For the Arabs. See, this is all history. So people sitting up, the, the Muslims were watching, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. The Jews created the religion for them. And they don't even know that. Now, I, little Walter Williams, comes along and, and tells the world, the African world, this is what's happening with Islam, guys. Little Walter Williams. Outside of the soil. The other components, the Old Testament. The Old well, you got, see, what makes up the Quran, I'm glad you brought that up, what makes up the Quran, like I told you before in, in the previous lecture, is the two sets of books. The Old Testament, which is the Pentateuch, and Psalms, written by Jewish writers, and the four Christian Gospels. That's what, that's, that's your Quran there. Now, they tell the Muslims that the angel Gabriel taught the Prophet Muhammad in 622 A.D. what God wanted Muhammad to give to mankind. Muhammad was illiterate. 
That's how the story goes. And that he, he memorized by way of mnemonics, which is, means memory, uh, all of the Quran that was given to him by the angel Gabriel. You see that? And that he dictated to his scribe what the angel Gabriel had taught him. Okay? Thus creating the Quran, thus creating Islam. But now wait, now hold it. Here comes little Walter Williams. He comes along and says, well, something's wrong with that. Because if the, I, I investigated, first I investigated the angel Gabriel. And I found out that angel Gabriel was a little bird. Mm -hmm. So now how can a little bird mm -hmm. teach a supposed human being anything? Suppose uh, Sir Boz will bring uh, Dr. Walter Williams to uh, this institution to give a lecture, and I end up being a little bird. <laughs> huh? You all are human beings out there. I guess, may I look out? You look. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it, it don't work. And guess, 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 guess who taught to Angel Gabriel? The angel Israfil. Israfil. Israfil is one of the archangels of the four angels of Islam. Israfil is a six tongue Herod monster. <laughs> six tongue. <laughs> Herod monster. See, you got, you got, you got the angel Gabriel, Israfil, Raphael, and Mikael. Those are the four angels of Islam. Okay? So now how can a bird teach anybody? How can a six-tongued Herod monster who taught the angel Gabriel? Huh? And then, now how did Jewish writings get into Islam, the book called the Quran? That was my question. How did you do it? Jews put it in there. But my, my question is also is the continent which is now known as Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and the people that they call Ethiopians that were once inhabitants of Arabia before the people that you see of my complexion are a little bit lighter. Okay. They call Arabs. Mm -hmm. How did the infusion of uh, uh, Judaism create uh, Islam? They have to, were they there? Because the, when you say Jew, you're talking about the Caucasian. Did you? Well, no, no. Uh uh. You're talking about, see, you think Jew is a race. No, it isn't. I All know. right, wait, now don't say you think about Caucasian. Well, Sammy Davis Jr. was not Caucasian, he was a Jew. Yeah, but we're talking about back then. Well, no, we're talking about anybody of any race, creed, or color can, uh, can, can embrace a religion. Right. Don't, so you don't say it, it was Caucasian. But well, you said um, the Jews of France sent a group right. into Syria for the sole purpose of creating. Literature known today as the Quran for the Mohammedan world, for the Arab world. That's how it happened. It was just a, like, okay, you take, uh, you heard of the Falashas? Right. Okay. The Kushim? Let's deal with the Falashas. Okay. The Falashas of Ethiopia, is that correct? Correct. It was that same group, the Alliance, you, uh, Israelite, Universal of Paris, France, sending Joseph Halevi into Ethiopia to create what is known today in history as the Falasha Jews. They did that. No one is telling you this, but they did that. Okay? In 1867, Joseph Halevi came into Ethiopia. The next time I come, I'll, I'll elaborate on that. Okay, so now here you have the same uh, uh, alliance, Israelite, Universal of Paris, France, sending a group of, of writers, rabbis, uh, uh, and scholars over there in Syria to create literature for the Mohammedan Arabs. Because Judaism already had published their uh, literature in 1475. The Christians had their literature printed in, uh, in 1516 uh, <coughs> the Nova Mentimentum. But the Mohammedan world had no literature. Because it, it was also the Ottoman Empire that actually the, spread it Islam. It's not, the Ottoman Empire Islam. did not spread Islam, they spread it Mohammedanism. Okay. That's what they spread, not Islam. Okay. See, gotcha. Islam is a religion based upon a book called the Quran. Without the Quran, you have no Islam. And I said before, that before the book uh, of the Quran was created, you had Mohammedanism. 
So the, the Ottoman Turks, beginning in 1300, and they uh, 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 began to uh, enforce and the spread of Mohammedanism. See, the life and biography of Muhammad came from one man, an African out of Spain. It's in my book. Uh, his name was Sheikh Al Akbar Muhaiddin Ibn Ali, aka as Ibn Al Arabi, alias Muhammad. See that? Now, they took his life and biography and made the Prophet Muhammad of Islam from there. Okay? His, he died. He was born in Spain in 1165. And he died in 1240 in Africa. And his followers and disciples began to spread his teaching and is known today as the Mohammedanism. And when, this was in 1239, uh, and then uh, uh, 61 years later, the Ottoman Turk and the Ottoman Empire came up, 1300. And they took this Mohammedanism theology that the disciples and, and the followers of Ibn al-Arabi had been teaching, and they began to enforce that throughout the Ottoman Empire all over North Africa, all into Egypt. They went up into the Balkans, that's part of the uh, 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 Ottoman Empire. They went into the, uh, southern uh, Russia, all up into uh, the parts of Russia and so forth, enforcing Mohammedanism. They said, they walk up to, they walk up to an individual, they say, Mohammed or die. They took a big sword. Now you wanna, you wanna embrace Mohammed, huh? Or do you wanna die? This is how they did it. See, it had nothing to do with Islam. Islam wasn't there. Islam is a, is a religion based upon a book called the Quran. Without the book called the Quran, you have no Islam. That religion was created by Jews. But the Muslim world, they don't know that. If you go and get a book, an encyclopedia called the Shorter Encyclopedia of Islam, on page 390, it's in my book, They'll tell you in the short encyclopedia of Islam there is no biography in existence for the Muhammad. Then it goes on to say on that same page that they have no historical data for a Muhammad being in Mecca. They tell you that. So without Muhammad in Mecca, see Muhammad is just like Moses. Moses has to be in a basket floating down the Nile River in order for that to be a Moses and Pharaoh's daughter, and you know the story. In order for that to be a Muhammad, he has to be born in Mecca. That's tradition is telling you that. But, the, but Islam, in the in short encyclopedia of Islam, says there's no data for that. They don't have no record of that, no Muhammad being in, in, in Mecca. You see? So you have, to, you have to use history in order for you to get out of this confusion. See, so I'm the person to come along, little Walter Williams, <laughs> out of Chicago, okay? Don't have no degrees, okay? I don't have no degree, I have a high school diploma. But we know where I got my doctorship from? You all. I got it from my African community. I don't want no white folks to give me a doctor's degree. Huh? My African community said that I am Dr. Walter Williams. So that's, that's you, you see, but I, I had to do all this study to come and bring you this information. See? I had to, had to do that. I'm constantly, see, I study every day. If I, I, I I'm not going to rest on my laurels. I'm not going to do that. If I do, it's over for Walter Williams. I got to keep going. I study all the time. See? Got to, I got to keep my mind going. Since I'm a young man, I got to keep going. Right. See? So this, these are notes here. Okay? I got to study these notes a little bit more and put it up here. See, so I can come off 
bring your dates and things that happen on those dates. See? That's what you need. That's what we need. That's what Dr. John Henry Clark said. He said, our people do not know history. They need to study European history as well as their own history. So I've done that. Yes. Uh, going back to the animal question right here, mm -hmm. uh, regarding um, the fighting that took place between the Crusades and the Seljuk Turks, mm -hmm. he would say Muslims, but we know that he meant the Turks. Mm -hmm. That's who it was with. Mm -hmm. uh, would you not describe them as monophysites? Yeah, they, they were a faction of uh, monophysitism. They didn't believe in no, uh, they didn't accept no Christ, no Jesus Christ as a human being. Because Jacob Bardez, who evangelized among them uh, in, in, in 543 under the, the suggestion and the appointment of uh, the wife of uh, Justinian I, Theodora, uh, remember me telling you that they built uh, four Jacob Bardez, uh, this building that is known today as the Jacobite Church, uh, to use as a headquarters so he can go out among the Arabs and evangelize among them and bring them a monophysitic uh, uh, theology. And this is where you get, uh, and see, when, when Ibn al-Arabi, she al akbar Mohaidin, Ibn Ali, a.k.a. as Ibn al-Arabi, alias Muhammad, he came along with monist theology. See? And when you deal with Islam, they always come tell you about the one, right? Mm -hmm. That comes from monist theology, a monism. What is monism? Monism says that everything comes from one substance. That's monism. See? So when Ibn al-Arabi came along, alias Muhammad, that's what, that was his theology. It's in my book, Historical Origin of Islam. And this is what monism means. And that's where you get monism or that one concept that's attached to Islam. Is monotheism the same thing as monotheism? Is it the same thing as monotheism? No, not quite. It's, it's on the same order. Yes, I would say on the same order, but different wording. No, these were, these were white folks out of France. See, and, and see, the same group, uh, the Alliance Israelite Universal of Paris, France. You ever heard of uh, the Lemas, supposed to be a, a Jewish sect down in, around South Africa? You ever heard of the Lemas? The Lemas? You remember that? They, they, took, they went in there, the Jews took some. Uh, some DNA samples from their jaws. Yes, and, yes, that's okay. what I'm talking about, yeah. Okay, well now, guess how they got to be Jews? Mm -hmm. That same group, Alliance Israelite Universal of Paris, France, sent Karl Marx down in, 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 in the, mm. uh, <laughs> 1891 mm. to create this, like they sent Joseph Halevi into Ethiopia to create what is known as the Falashas. Wow. See, no one is telling you this, but little Walter Williams. <laughs> you see that? This is what's happening. Yes. Uh, would this be a correct statement that the polemic really did not stop until we got Mohammedanism between the diaphysitics and the monophysites? Would that be a correct uh, statement? I would say yes. 
Okay. So you get it. Okay. All right. Need I say more? Okay. When you got that definite split. Right. When you, okay. Right. That's where the polemic stopped. Nine hundred and twenty-one years you later. Ended up with the Christians, and you ended up eventually with uh, the Muslims. <coughs> you had the Monophysites in there. Okay. So the Monophysites became the Muslims later. Okay. So you got it. Of Islam is a continuation, mm. actually, of the historical origin of Christianity. Mm. That's the evolution. Wow. See, this is <laughs> this is it. We're not talking about no theology. Let us pray. <laughs> Islam al Laikum. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about human history. What happened in human history? What happened to our ancestors in human history? This is what happened to our ancestors. This is pertaining to us. See, so we have to learn history to break all this up. For you to understand who you are, what happened to our ancestors, and do something about it. And not be fooled anymore. Because when you embrace a religion, guess what a religion will do? Take your life away from you. It will steal your life because that religion is not telling you who you are and what you was born with. It's telling you to take all of your life spirituality and give it to the religion. So that's stealing your life, isn't it? Then all religions will do what? They will lie to you and deceive you because they tell you about a dead white man on the cross living on earth as Jesus the Christ, and tell you about a, a, a faceless white man riding on a camel, talking about the prophet Muhammad. They're talking about a Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Moses, which the Jews are saying never existed. They're saying it themselves. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, what, yes, I know. The young man is gone now. You said you would add another side effect? Yes. Inferiority complex? Inferiority complex. I got to add that. These religions will give you an inferiority complex. You will feel inferior because you as a human being cannot live up to your savior. You see? You cannot live up to the God of these uh, religions. See, all religions have a God. Christianity has a dead white man on the cross mm -hmm. called Christ. Islam has Allah. Judaism has Yahweh and Jehovah. Buddhism has this fat dude with titties and a diaper <laughs> called Buddha. <laughs> huh? See? All male. Okay? See? So therefore, you cannot live up to these. The Christianity said that all of you, uh, people of humanity, are dirty rags. Mm -hmm. See, so therefore, you feel bad. I can't live. I, in order for me to, to feel good, I got to embrace this day of waving on the cross and be a Christian. See? But see, you, you're practicing fear, inferiority coming from these religions. You're inferior. Did you want to add something to that? We had a child who was helping to bring out this point. The couple and the two children sitting back here. And he was responding to the picture of the little boy uh, with the Christ image looking down over him. And he was simply saying that that puts uh, folks of color in an inferior position. You got this white God looming over you. Okay, so therefore you will always feel inferior to that. Mm -hmm. Correct. Because it's being presented to you as the superpower. Mm -hmm. mm. There's something? You accept this thing, take it into your consciousness, into your subconscious mind. It superimposes on you and make you inferior. Because you know that your God and your Savior is a European image. Not an image of you or any member of your family. So it makes you feel inferior. This is what our nether was saying. This is what the, the man was saying. That's true. Absolutely true. So, Mr. Williams, so the significance of these religions is actually to um, strip us of our 
divine spirituality and, and, and knowledge and inner self or something like that. And that's what it is. That's what it's stands for. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. And you can. That's how they control you. Yeah. See, they can't control you with an individual, independent mind. Mm -hmm. They can't control you that way. So once you begin to step out of that, mm -hmm. and you start to seeking, you know, actual historical facts, mm -hmm. then there's a problem. No, it's not. No, I'm saying you, you, you will oppose a problem to, to those yeah. in, in the authority of those religions who control those religions. Yeah. No, yeah. It, listen. You don't have to tell you no question, God. And, you know, well, and don't be know. around them to, to tell you that. No, I know. I'm and when not, you divest I'm just your, saying, I'm just, yeah. You know, but when you divest yourself away from that, mm -hmm. you don't have that to worry about anymore. See, like a, a brother in L.A. I was giving the lecture mm -hmm. last year in L.A. And he told me, he said, during the question and answer, he said, we should go and pick up arms and, and kill the white man. <laughs> oh. I said, are you crazy fool? Crazy. I said, here we don't even own a hairpin back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying to me? You know? He said, well, what, what can I do? I said, what can we do? I said, all you have to do is change your mind. He can't, no one control what you're thinking up here. Just like the Arab in your neighbor got a store, right? If you don't want that Arab there, you don't go to his store. He's going to close it down anyway. You change your mind. Say, I don't go, I'm not going to the Arab store. If everybody unifies and says, we don't go to the Arab store, the Arab's got to close his door. And there's nothing you can do. He can't come around and shoot you because you didn't come to his store. So you change your mind. That's all you have to do. Change your mind. Say, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. I'm, I'm Go to Reverend Chicken Wing Church and turn in your cross and this dead white man and say, and here's your Bible and here's your God. I don't want this anymore in my life. I'm getting all this trash out of my life. I'm taking back my life. This is what you have to do. Take back your life. That's how they control me. What, what made these uh, Coptic Africans uh, put all of this stuff in place with these uh, Europeans? Because the European is still a European back then, like he is a European today. Right. Okay? You have what made Condoleezza Rice go with the, the regime of George Bush? What made uh, Colin Powell and Clarence Thomas? Favor, power, the little power, the little crumbs that they can get from being associated with them and being their stooges. That's all that is. But it was obvious that the Europeans were coming to them and they weren't accepting them into their uh, secret uh, uh, society. That's correct. The Coptic Africans. Right. Then the powers was with the Africans. So I don't. You understand what I'm saying? The the, the power was with the Africans. The grassroots didn't accept that. That's what the argument was over for 921 years. The grassroots didn't accept, accept this uh, white image of Serapis or Christ. But uh, uh, the Greeks found a group that went along with them, like Armstrong Williams, went along with George Bush, and other uh, Negro preachers went along with the face base, uh, base program. Okay? So, so you have that. That's for personal reasons and personal gains and so forth and so on. That's all that is. But I don't understand what the Coptic Africans stood to gain. What was the actual trade-off? If they, if the powers with the Coptic Africans and they, and the Europeans had to actually come to them to uh, legitimize their thing, what was the gain of the Coptic Africans? That's what I. Was but here's what you have to understand: the power was with the with the Greeks. And the Roman, they ruled Egypt. Okay, that they had the power, but they did not have the power to create a religion. They didn't know how to do that. So they went to you, this African, and made him an offer that he could not refuse. Hmm. Okay, got to say, hey, you can ride around in a Cadillac. Your wife can have me coach. You can live in fine homes. All that, you just come on with me. Okay? We leave those rest of those Negroes on out there. Let them do what they want to do. See? So that's how it's done. The power was with the, the Greeks and the Romans. Okay? But uh, to make what the Greeks wanted and get from them, it was in the power 
of the African. And they betrayed, that's the reason why I said the Melkite, Uncle Tom's of antiquity. That's the reason why I labeled them then. Yes, sir. You said 1926 was the first conference of Islam, right? The first meeting in first Islam's meeting. history. Where was it at? And what was, what was coming out of this meeting? It was in, what, the, what they was doing, see, the, the fall of the Byzantine government had, 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 had was defeated in World War I. World War I is 1914 to 1918. Okay. The last of the Ottoman Sultanate was in 1919. The Sultanate, or the Sultan, who was the head of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, whoever it may have been, was also the head of the Mohammedan world. You got that? It was the head of it. So since uh, the Ottoman Turkish Empire fell, there was no Sultanate anymore. So what, what they was trying to do was, since they got Islam with this Quran, Coming out of 1919, he was looking for a caliph. He wanted someone to, to be the head of Islam, a caliph. That's what they was looking for. They were looking for a caliphate. And the first meeting that they had was in 1926 in the area they called Mecca. If you go to Mecca, see Mecca is a, a very modern city. <coughs> And that was the world's first Hajj, 1926. Based on this meeting. Based on this meeting, yeah. Now, the, the, the Muslims, <laughs> we went to, me and my wife, we took a trip, a 10-day trip from Chicago, and we flew into D.C., rented a car, and began to travel. And we, we stopped in, in this a mosque in, in Washington, D.C. And while we were there, long story short, we always buy literature of stupid, always snooping around, doing, trying to find something. See, I'm, 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 I'm Sambo, okay? You know, Sambo and, and, and uh, a little black Sambo, I'm not a little black Sambo, but uh, uh, what's that? <coughs> Uncle Tom. Remember Uncle Tom's cabin? Sambo is the one that did all the talking. He told white folks stuff. Uncle Tom didn't do anything. You can, Uncle Tom can see ten of us get killed. He wouldn't say nothing. He said, old, old, old Uncle Tom. But Sambo is the one that talks, see, and tells, right? So I'm the Sambo of the African community. I come and talk to you and tell you things. You see? So I'm your Sambo. So we was at this mosque, my wife and I, and we wanted to get into the library there, to look around the books. So we were sitting out in the open air in, on, on a bench, she and I, and all of a sudden, she said, they said that the, the librarian would be back in about an hour, so we waited. So all of a sudden, a brother walks up to us and handed, handed me three hardback books. I said, okay, thank you. And I left. And when I got home, back to Chicago, after we made our 10-day trip, I began to, I looked in this book, this thunder, it's called The Sword and the Holy Quran, written by uh, Abdul Aziz, his son, uh, King Saad, that's where Saudi Arabia, Arabia was named after. And in this book, it had the first meeting in Islam's history. I said, wow! Mm -hmm. 